Hey all, we're taking a look at chapter five now. We're thinking about what happens outside of our classroom, what happens outside of the learning campus. How do we deal with those family members? How do we deal with the other elements of the community that help support our learners? Um, you can obviously teach the students uh, together much better than you could alone. So obviously families, um, parental and guardian support can be a very valuable way to uh, support uh, the lives of uh, your students. Um, and it's sometimes a challenge to figure out how do you make those connections. That's one of those elements that we keep trying to uh, figure out better ways to address in and out of our classroom. So in this chapter, we're going to think a little bit and talk about sensitivity and understanding. We're going to discuss some of the guidelines for working with parents. We're going to talk about when and how to reach out to families. We're going to try and uh, discuss that elusive parent-teacher conference um, and then think about different activities that we can have to make sense of how to deal with these situations. So the parent-teacher night, the open house, um, is many times the, the butt of jokes. So we either see uh, the, the, the child, the learner, the student, uh, either being very proud to go to parent teacher conferences or have the, the parent and, uh, and the teacher, uh, meet, um, or the, the student is terrified of the parent teacher conference and the open house night. Um, and generally, uh, at least socially, it tends to be, you know, in many ways a joke, um, to highlight the negative of what's happening in the classroom. Many times we see the, the parent guardian and that teacher role uh, don't intersect. So we have to think about what misconceptions our parents are bringing into the classroom, into these meetings, and also what misconceptions we might bring into this. So different ways that we can try to understand our parents um, is to think about what, you know, connections or life experiences they might have. Um, you know, what life experiences do our children have, but then also what life experiences do uh, the parents and guardians of our, our learners have? Um, you know, and this might be something that you uh, generally uh, study through your building's administration. It might be something that you try and uh, make some sense of. But how might their, be, their experiences be different than your experiences? Um, do uh, do the parents do the, does the, the the parents do they have more than one computer in the home? Can they read a menu in at least three languages? Um, do you have parents that have friends or relatives that have not gone into high school or past high school that have dropped out of high school um, have never flown in an airplane? Um, I remember my first year teaching, I realized that I, I was discussing, the beach um, with students in my class and describing the beach. And I realized after talking for a couple of class periods that my many of my students had never, ever been to a beach before, never seen the ocean. Um, and so we, we took a class trip to go to, which was a big experience, to go to the waterfront and see what the ocean look like and many of them, it was just mind blowing that 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 something like that could occur. Um, what about living in large homes? What about knowing someone that has been killed in or killed in a drug or gang related incident or belong to a country club or, you know, it, there's different ways to think about and, and calibrate our expectations for dealing with parents. You know, in the past, we've talked about um, risk in the classroom um, with our students. So we've talked about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Just the same way that if our students have specific concerns, they're not going to be willing to listen to us. We have to consider what we're, you know, what's the approach point for our parents as well. We need to remember that this is a, a cyclical reaction. We need to remember that 
Um, we need to create opportunities for exposure. We need to build awareness. We need to try and create experiences and those go, those will impact our beliefs about our population, about our parents, and then conversely, um, about our learners. And that will lead to action and that will lead to, um, you helping start up a, a STEM night in your building or having pizza at STEM night or having a literacy night or a robot club, uh, but a, a general belief that we can make those connections and impact positively, not just the, the students, but also parents and families. When we think about working with parents and families, we uh, have to ask why. We want to establish a good relationship Generally, we see that students whose families have a good working relationship with teachers earn higher grades. Attendance is not really a problem. They are motivated. They see the value in school. Um, the student sees that the parent or guardian and the family generally value school. So they also generally will value school. Um, so we have higher grades, regular attendance, increased motivation, generally like school, and generally have fewer behavioral problems. So for the most part, it's a win-win. So it is value add if you try and build, uh, you create that working relationship with family and parents, guardians. We think about family participation. There are different ways that we can do this. A lot of times we see activities that fulfill the mission of the school. Earlier, I talked about, um, you know, a STEM night, or I talked about a literacy night, or sometimes we have like robotics club or competitions. We see uh, athletics, we see, um, you know, uh, a band or music performances, different ways that fulfill the mission of the school, and then also, um, you know, help bring in parents. One of the things that we want to take a look at is who are these uh, systems and these activities designed to support? So many times we see that these activities fulfill the mission of the school, but then also they, they reify this belief system of white middle-class families. And so we need to pay attention to our population and uh, think about what is really important culturally for our constituency. Um, we see that there's sometimes a mismatch between the family experience, the family member's experience, and the culture of the school. Um, and many, and we have to ask the question, you know, do not just do our students feel welcome and a, and a member of our school, but do parents, do parents feel like they don't belong either? Um, and the, the parents or guardians are equally concern that they're not going to do well in school. Um, you know, in, in some of the earlier questions we asked about students that, you know, their parents didn't finish high school. And so sometimes we see situations where, you know, you have a young parent or young guardian and they are caring for a, a young, you know, a young child. Um, and so we're sort of like creating this, this cyclical pattern. Um, we also have to make the assumption that parents do care, that parents are knowledgeable, parents are influential, parents do contribute to the education of their child. Many times we come in with a negative mindset that the parents just don't care or it's a bad home situation. When we fully do not know, we need to always remember that um, you know, our, our learners, our children are always listening and usually it's the parents that have the biggest megaphone. And so if we want to reach our learners or students, we want to think about our parents as well and not go into a relationship or work with them, assuming that they are not knowledgeable and they do not care. When you deal with parents and you think about family involvement, there are certain expectations that you should outline. At the beginning of the year, just the same way that you might think about classroom management plan, just the same way you might think about your classroom rules, you might consider the expectations that you have of the parents. Um, you expect them to uh, be worthwhile members in the care and support of their child, of your student. Um, you should be considerate of parental aspirations. What do parents want from their learners? It's not all about you, 
and and it's not all about just the student, but what do parents want? Um, most times parents are more than willing to tell you exactly what they think their child needs to work on that year. And it's up to you as the professional to weigh that um, and balance that out with what you see from the student, because sometimes the student is a different person in front of you away from home. And then also um, longitudinally, as the child grows throughout K-12, what you see them needing um, and where they're headed. Um, when you think about family involvement, you also want to think about parent-child communication. Uh, sometimes the child is the linkage between uh, school and home. You want to think about parent and school contact. Um, is there an open door policy for parents? Um, some schools, some classrooms are, are open door policy. The parent can come in at any point and help out. It's never a problem. You as the classroom teacher, but then also your building, there are different roles that you need to consider about what's acceptable and what's not. And then also we have to think about parent home supervision. Um, when is there a need to reach out and extend beyond just the scope of the typical K-12 environment and think about what's happening at home to support our learners? Uh, different guidelines for effective family partnerships. There is a need to uh, expand traditional options for participation, uh, expand beyond just the typical bring in these supplies. Um, some schools have volunteering or recruitment models. Um, there are expectations that parents will volunteer a certain number of hours per semester or per, per year. Um, there are uh, times when schools sort of identify or detail conditions, cultural and home conditions that they want to see from parents, um, expectations of reading or literacy or learning at home and homework and resources that are there. There are different tools. So there are teachers that send out weekly newsletters um, or have uh, parent-teacher conferences or video conferences, ways for the teacher to communicate home, but then also Communication usually is a feedback loop, so how are you listening to the parents and guardians to see what they want and what they are getting and what they think should happen? There's also opportunities for um, decision-making, so we see opportunities for advocacy and a, a PTA organization uh, where parents can get involved in the school and make change happen. And then also uh, community partnerships, ways to connect with local businesses and local groups to improve what's happening in the classroom. We think about general guidelines. It's important for contact with families to be to begin early and continue often. Uh, make that first communication a positive one. Many times our open house doesn't happen until a month, you know, four to six weeks into the school year. Uh, some schools will have an open house a couple days before the start of school to sort of outline this is the expectation for the year. So try and make that communication positive and right, you know, super early and then also keep up that communication over time. Uh, keep info on all your students. Think about the ABCs of our students. What are their names? What are their backgrounds? What conditions do they come in our classroom with? Um, you know, think about what makes those students tick because in those early communications, it's, it's always shocking to me where you've had their child for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. You're still getting to know names and stuff like that. And parents come up and, and they want to know almost like a, a report card on their child during the first month. And you're just like, I'm just getting to know them right now. Um, and so just keep, you know, pretty detailed information so you know what's happening. Um, look for guidance. Look for guidance from school principal. Look for guidance from mentor teachers. Um, some schools have very specific policies about contact with home. Um, so they might indicate that it's only through email or it might be through phone or phone numbers. It might be through just the school phone number, not your phone number. Um, there are different ways to use uh, texting platforms. Um, you know, some schools value and use social media. Others, uh, it's forbidden. Um, so it's important to know what the expectations and what's acceptable and not and protect yourself.
you know, protect yourself in the process. Reach out to parents right at the beginning of the school year. Think about registration time. That's, you know, two, three days before school starts or a month before school starts when students are registering. Uh, send immediately a welcome home letter with philosophy and rules. You see an example in Oaks. Uh, make phone calls if and when needed. Uh, translate. Um, it's important to understand that uh, your your parents and guardians of students in your classroom may not have the ba same background as you and they might not speak the same language as you. And so you need to identify those situations and get support as needed. Um, I don't think it's a get support if needed. It is a get support, get support as needed um, because we are seeing that our world is increasingly multilingual. And so be prepared for that. Send out a parent survey. Send out a survey to see what your parents want and need from you, what they want and need from their children um, during that year. Uh, have them fill out student info sheets uh, to detail what their expectations are and share information about stuff that's happening. Let them see that your classroom is a vibrant uh, place, that learning is happening and it's exciting. Different ways to reach out. Um, we talked about open house nights and family nights. There's newsletters that you can create. Um, you can have a website or a blog for you personally, professionally for your classroom. You can send out regular emails or email blasts. You can have uh, an email or a phone call with great news. You won't believe what Suzanne did this week. Uh, sending out weekly planners so that students can see what's coming up the next week and parents can sign off and create that communication or feedback loop. Uh, progress reports, obviously, um, but you know, progress reports, report cards, um, there is a certain amount of stress and finality in that. So you wanna make sure that that's not the only time that parents hear from you. There's several examples that we have in here of different uh, pages that you can use. I definitely, uh, recommend building up your method of communication. So in terms of method of communication, the, there's advantages and disadvantages. Um, the nice thing about written communication email letter is that you get that paper trail. So if there is an issue, if there is a concern, you have the paper trail. It's very wise to have all that saved and document it. Just the same way that you would document student behaviors, you sort of keep that uh, paper trail. The challenge is that a lot of tone is lost in text. So for some people, um, academic language, academic discourse is a bit jarring. And um, a letter or an email from a classroom teacher or from the school is sometimes not taken positively. Generally, it could be a positive communication, but there's just this belief that it most likely is going to be negative. You also want to be very detail oriented and look out for those grammar and typos and stuff like that. You are supposed to be the more knowledgeable other. You're supposed to make sure that you don't have those uh, issues and challenges and that you, you look and sound professional in written communication. Phone calls. Uh, can be a positive tool. We often see teachers will slip, you know, in a in a prep period or after school or before school to make a phone call. It's a little bit more personal. Um, you can quickly talk through things with a parent to verbalize concerns, ask questions. Um, we also know that um, phone calls can be a challenge. They can be a challenge to set up a phone call and schedule that time. You most times are very busy throughout the day and it's not as easy to slip out to make a phone call. Um, sometimes just the, the voice call can be misconstrued at times. And we also have the opportunity for in-person meetings. And in-person, I would also suggest might be like video conferencing, um, you know, as a possibility. Obviously, that has advantages and disadvantages. We think about in-person meetings. Uh, we talk about conferences, parent-teacher conferences, group meetings. The nice thing is that we can sit and have dialogue about your child. We can show examples of work. Sometimes we can bring in other teachers, other uh, faculty and staff. We can bring the child in. Um, there are challenges with that. Um, there, Yes, if there's challenges with 
scheduling a phone call, then there's definitely challenges with an in-person meeting. Not everyone has the luxury to be able to take time off during the school day to go in and meet with the teacher. And also, there's the potential for conflict. I've been involved in parent-teacher conflict uh, conferences where there has been conflict. There's been conflict between a parent and a teacher or a parent and an administrator or a staff or a parent and their child. Um, and so in person, we need to, uh, you know, sort of mentally prepare for some of those, you know, possibilities. So if we talk about that, that home school connection, there are ways to make it a little bit more fun. There are ways to make it less, uh, apprehend it to have a little bit, uh, less fuel to the fire when we make that homeschool connection. Um, so maybe throughout the year have family members share, uh, you know, things that they like, uh, favorite albums or favorite books or music or customs or traditions, or, you know, what's relatively easy to share with the classroom that doesn't privilege or disadvantage others, but that others will value. Um, what talents, you know, a lot of times our parents have expertise at home, have them, you know, try and identify what in-house talent you have that you could bring in. You know, if, if you have, uh, parents that are, you know, it, that work at a bank or they are, uh, you know, coders or programmers or they are scientists, um, or they work in food service or whatever it is that your parents do, get a sense of what they do and if they would be interested in coming in to help out when you go through some of your content and identify ways to embed them in what's happening. Other ways to make connections, uh, bring music into the classroom. I, I'm a big fan of bringing music into the classroom. I still try to do it as much as possible in my classes. Um, bring music into the classroom. Ask your students, ask family, what music represents the cultures or the interests um, of the student, of the parent or guardian, and bring it in so that we can um, share it. So it might be as students are doing group work, it might be as students are taking a little bit of a break, um, they might have you know time test. You know, bring music into the classroom. Make it a little bit more uh, human, the experience in the classroom. Also, identify opportunities for classroom design. We talked earlier about parents bringing in photos of the parent, guardian, and child or, um, you know, different materials. Maybe there's a way to bring in uh, some content from home into the classroom. So there could be pieces of art, dramatic pieces, um, you know, different ways to connect the school to home and, and you know, uh, and home to school. And think about, let's really honor not just the children, but the parents or guardians of those individuals that come in and, and sort of help us out. We want to be considerate of when tempers flare. So we have a video about uh, a, an incident. Um, the, the challenge is just the same way that we would have uh, a critical incident with a student or disagreement with a student. We have to be considerate of not just the, the words and the actions that we have in that moment, but how does it look to other people? Um, whenever I would have a, a verbal altercation with a student, I was, I tried to be considerate of how this might look to a third party. Um, and I think the same thing goes for, um, interactions with parents or guardians, because there are times when tempers will flare and we'll have to be considerate. To prepare for this, we think about conferences with parents and families before the meeting, have the student complete a self-evaluation. Let the student know what's going to happen. Let the student know why, you know, that this meeting is coming up and don't surprise the student. I don't believe that it's, uh, you know, if you're trying to build a positive connection with the learner, don't make it a surprise. Um, you know, have them complete a self-evaluation. What are their thoughts? Why are we there? What are the accomplishments? What can we do in the future? Think about the, the specific components of the issue. 
What's the problem? Why are we there? Um, send the reminder to the parents. Uh, ask the parents what they want to accomplish. So we have the self-avow from the child, and we have the teacher putting together records of, like, okay, what's the issue here? And then ask the parents in the reminder, what do they think that this meeting is about? Uh, document all that. And then set the agenda for the meeting. Once again, pay attention to uh, language, expectation, needs, uh, and needs of parents and guardians and deal with that as needed. Uh, make sure that it's not a an impediment. Um, and uh, try not to have many times our student is the primary translator for our parents when they go to school. Um, it's probably not a good idea to have the student be the primary translator in that parent-teacher conference. During the meeting, start with the strengths. Start with that positivity. Start with the, the good, positive components of the child and their behavior. Share that self-evaluation if you had it. It's, let's begin with the student and show what the student thinks about the situation, samples of work, uh, their data. Start with the strengths, start with the self-evaluation, start with the data, keep it all positive. Ask the parents what they think. Ask them what they think. Answer all the questions. Um, don't go in with your, uh, your point that you'd like to press. Show them the data. Show them what you're dealing with and ask for their response. Answer all questions that they might have. Um, if it's something that you don't know the answer to, which is going to happen, have notes, have uh, pen and paper ready so you can jot that down and get back to them. Um, listen. Listen and hear. Uh, save time. Hold them. Uh, for that moment and listen to what they have to say. Be an active listener. Uh, more listening, less talking is a good thing. Um, and remain polite and pleasant. You are a professional. You're an educational professional. I know things get uh, uh, a little bit tense, but, you know, be that educational uh, professional. After the meeting, what's the plan? What are we going to do now? You know, we, what, what's the resolution to this? Make a plan of what needs to be done. Call in more resources if needed. Your building has the resources. The district has the resources. Go find them. Um, and if they don't, make a stink. <laughs> um, but call in those resources. Call in the, the support that you need. You are there to support your learners. The parents are vital members of that um, plan. Thank the parents for the support. Um, talk about what, what the follow-up is going to be. What are the next steps? And then how are we going to revisit this um, and, and make those follow-up agreements um, in person, uh, in writing, or by phone call, the communication stuff that we talked about before. Um, so we're being thoughtful about these parent-teacher conferences. When we have a parent-teacher conference, your student most likely is very concerned. Um, and your parents, the guardians, are also many times concerned. They are also nervous and anxious, probably more so than the, the learners, than your students in your classroom. So appreciate the time that they are giving you. Do not evaluate the family. Do not, it is not your opportunity to evaluate the family and their successes or failures with their children. It's not your chance to, um, you know, uh, teach them how to parent. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes, the parent is the expert on their child, or at least they're trying to be. Um, use your body language to show that you care. Use your body language to show that you are holding them for a moment in space, in time, and you are listening to what they have to say. Um, far too often I will be in a meeting and we have, you know, the, the teacher is staring at the laptop or, God forbid, staring at a phone or just staring off in the distance or at a paper. Close the computer. Like, if you need to open the laptop to get to something, that's fine, or the tablet to get to something. But if not, close it and pay attention to the parent. Talk to another human being. Um, paraphrase your understanding so that, uh, paraphrase your understanding of what parents say through active listening. So 
as parents are talking, repeat it back to them to show them that you are paying attention, that you're understanding what they have to say. Um, you know, so, so let me get this straight. What you're saying is and sort of resituate it so that you can show them that you care, but also that you fully understand what you're there for. In these communication loops, state your concerns. You are the educator, you are the professional. Um, don't place blame. Uh, we don't want to come in and you aren't checking her homework. And when she doesn't complete the homework, she's not going to get this information. Um, we're not there to place blame. We understand that there is a concern. There is a situation. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that we are positive in seeking resolution. So instead of you're not checking her homework, you're suggesting I'm afraid that she is going to be behind because this is not happening. Um, focus on the behaviors. We're not going to look at types of students or labels or, you know, any of the multitude of labels that we have in our schools, in society. We're not going to use those in these discussions. We're going to focus on specific behaviors of learners and ways that we have concerns about that and things that we can do to address it. As we continue to unpack this, you are a team. How can parents help you? How can you help parents? But how can parents help you? Uh, what are some of the guidelines they can do to help? When parents make a choice, we need to respect their choice. It is their child, ultimately. We need to respect it. Um, we're not there to force other suggestions. I've had a multitude of situations where I would have a parent-teacher conference. I would side with the student. I would disagree with what the student, with the parent or guardian wanted in the in the situation. But ultimately. You have to go with what the parent wants. Um, follow through. Do what you say you're going to do. Um, if you if you indicate that you are going to do something, you follow through on it. We're talking about humans' lives. We're talking about human beings. We're talking about children in your classroom. If you say you're going to do something, you need to follow through. You need to make sure that you are accountable. Also. Avoid confrontation. You are the professional. Remain calm. Remain uh, attentive. Listen. Talk about data. Talk about the 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 details that we expressed before. Um, and and think about the the language. If you see it escalating, you have to figure out the verbal judo to extricate yourself from the situation. It is not going anywhere positive. You need to conclude the meeting. Um, and there are different elements of verbal judo that you can use. Um, I can see you care deeply about this, but this is no longer productive. You can be an adult in this situation and suggest that we will come back at another time when, you know, my assistant principal can be here to join us for this meeting. Okay. Um, it, it, it should not be confrontational. If you feel like it is getting that point, it's time to conclude the meeting. Um, and, and you need to have that opportunity to sort of disconnect from that. Um, and that could be a challenge. So one of the things that we do in our groups, one of the things that we do in, in class face to face is we role play. Role play is a fantastic way uh, to deal with classroom management issues. Obviously, face to face, it's a little bit easier than online. Um, but role playing is a great way to deal with classroom management or thinking through our classroom management policies and um, not just the teaching side, but the parent teacher conference side. Um, but it's a great way to think about what do we do when we have the, the, the student that comes in and, you know, we have a parent teacher conference and we had those individuals that are critical, that are quiet, you know, overly anxious, um, or the parents that are overprotective and their child can do no wrong. Um, what do we do in those different instances? How do we deal with that? Um, and how do we, 
you know, be there to continue the relationship with parents? How do we be there to support our learners? And then also protect ourselves professionally and personally. So in summary, we're going to remember the three eyes. We're going to think about information, we're going to think about interests, and we're going to think about invitation. First off, information. Early and often relay the rules and procedures to let parents know about your method for classroom instruction, assessment, and evaluation. How do you do business? Um, at the beginning of the school year, you tell your students how you do business, and then you relay that information to parents and guardians. Uh, tell families how your classroom operates. There's no surprises. Um, and then stick to it. You know, follow your lead. Um, we also want to think about interests. We want to think about the, you know, the child's hobbies, their skills, their goals, um, what is important at home. Um, it might be music, it might be art, but what makes the, the, the child a human being outside of school? And try and bring some of that into your classroom. Try and bring some of that in so that we can create that positive, supportive, inclusive environment. And last but not least, invitation. Um, having, um, if not an open door policy for parents and families and guardians to join the classroom through volunteering, celebrations, PTA, different family activities and events, um, are there other ways that they can be a part of that learning space and a part of that community, that culture that you're building in your classroom. So with that, I appreciate you. I appreciate you for sticking through to the end of this. Hopefully this was of value to you and I'll see you in the next chapter.